I've got to say, I find the combination of the 1950s hairstyle with the, you know, 1450s dress to be a very fabulous combo. <laughs> Anachronism, who is she? Hello and good morning, kind friends and companions. Now, last month I made myself something very practical and lovely. This month I am feeling wholly impractical. It is the Halloween season and I think I want to make myself a costume. A nice medieval dress sounds fantastic and it has been a while. Now I've made a ton of medieval dresses over the years and every time I usually do something a little different, something that's new to me. A new technique, a new finishing method, a new pattern, something to help keep it interesting and not just doing the same thing over and over. And I think this time it's gonna be a nice princess scene. You know, a nice kind of over the bust princess scene. Now we don't have a ton of examples of those medieval but one of the most clear and like definite examples is A Virgin and Child by Jean Fouquet. Now the anatomy on this painting is a little bit suspect and that maybe throws the whole painting itself into question a little bit, uh, especially this is really, really late for what we think of as medieval. Fashion is very rapidly changing into kind of more early Renaissance styles. So, you know, I think as long as we take this with a big old grain of historical salt and just have fun and don't think about it too hard, I think this will make a really fun Halloween costume. Now I am gonna go in a slightly different direction color-wise. I have this very lovely, beautiful red wool and I'm, I'm gonna make myself a red curl. It's funny, I feel like I keep joking with friends about like red curdle society and weirdly enough, I don't have a red curdle. I have curdles and coat hardies and ugh, dresses with red in them, but not necessarily one that's just red. So now it's time. Now, pattern-wise, we have a few options. I could go for a just completely modern commercial pattern. In fact, that's what my very, very first ever garment I made was a medieval princess seemed, I think, commercial pattern. I made it way too big and that is part of the problem with modern big name company patterns is that they're meant to skim the body. They're meant to go over whatever sort of shapewear you have underneath versus the kind of current conventional thinking for late medieval fashion, which is that the garment shapes you. So it, it would still work as a starting point and then you just kind of adjust it until it works. But I think that is not what I have in mind for this one. Now I could also draft out the pattern with a bunch of numbers. Alternatively, there's draping, which I think is one of the best solutions, but it's a little tricky to do on yourself. So I, uh, I think what I'm actually gonna do is I'm, I do have old versions of my patterns. Like I think this one is my, yep, my heraldic kirtle circa 2018 and I'm going to start with these and then adjust them. Here is basically what my old pattern looks like just in small form. Technically there's actually some, some gores kind of about here and here but this is the actual overall shape that we're working with. Now if I want to make a princess seam right down the middle of the bust here that means approximately I would want to just simply take this and cut it right down the middle, right? Because we want the center front to be a nice straight seam so you know kind of sort of like this and then it would just connect like this. The problem is we do actually want this front piece to continue up the shoulder. It kind of looks like in the reference image, we have a seam that goes through the shoulder. So I think that technically what the actual pattern adjustment is gonna be is cut this shoulder approximately there. So this is our new side piece. And then these pieces here are the center front. Like kind of roughly, you have the front piece, the side front, 
The back, I don't actually know if I'm going to do much adjustment to it. I could, I suppose, cut a seam here so that it, it mirrors the front. Or potentially what I could do is kind of make it look like one of the Herjolsnes gown gores and make it so that there's a narrow gore here. Rather than transferring all of this to paper first, I decided to go with fabric so that I could just mark down all of the old pattern pieces and make my adjustments straight onto the fabric zigzagging and cutting pieces together as needed until I got it approximately what we already talked about. And here is the result of that quick bit of experimenting. So I did a quick little zipper in the back just to quickly get something together that worked. And I do already have some changes I want to make. Like you can see here where the, the bust is kind of collapsing and making a crease. I do think that this like two inch zone needs to be just a little bit smaller. And then conversely, you can kind of see here the where my bust is, the apex of my bust. This should be a bit more rounded and not as flattened. So this area needs to come out just a smidgen. And then back in again for the very center top right here, this little ticky tuck zone. I think part of the reason for this in particular is that this pattern was originally meant to be a bit more of a off the shoulder kind of vibe, but I think that for this next thing, I do want it to be a little bit more on shoulder. I feel like that matches the source picture just a little bit better. So we are just gonna pinch that in and which actually means what's really gonna happen is the angle of this is gonna adjust up because right now the angle of this strap is super out. So we're just gonna smooch it up a little bit and that will bring this in pretty sure. So that will be a fun little bit of adjustment. The back, I do think I am in fact going to make it so that there's a seam down the back because then I can add some flare right here and that'll get rid of that tuck right there. I just need to fuss with the pattern until it does what I want. So I've gone ahead and adjusted that neckline so that it's fitting much more closely to my chest, which is good. I took out this area just a smidgen, not a lot, like less than maybe half an inch between the two, just a smidgen. And then you can see I've left open that area at the bust that I think it needs to be let out a little bit. And this, I feel like for me, is sometimes a handy way to see how much do I actually need to add to a certain area? Because in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm going to add like a, a you know, a, a, an inch or something. But when you actually look at it, it's like may, maybe a smidge over a half an inch on each side is what I'm going to be adding to these two sections. The other thing you can do is take a little, little fish shaped piece and then we're just going to kind of tuck that on top. And then if you want, you could do a bunch of pins or you could even use a sharpie or something to mark around it and then transfer that to your your pattern making process it's going to account for the fact that there's an opening in here that isn't there before so now that we are mostly happy with how the pattern is looking we can cut it back up into its respective pieces and what's nice about sewing on the different elements where we made it bigger or smaller is those are now integral to the the fabric we don't have to go back and alter a paper pattern this is the pattern in fact if i want to i could just not at all make a paper pattern just keep these pieces and that is forever and always my reference point so let's go ahead and start cutting it up Right, I have cut out all my different pattern pieces here ready to go. Now, you remember how I had a left side and a right side for each piece? I ended up actually stitching them together back to back, which is really nice because it helps kind of true up any pieces that got a little bit misaligned as I was cutting everything out. So that works really well and it also makes them very sturdy. So I have pattern pieces all set to go here. I did give them a very nice ironing steam to help mush out any curves that kind of came up with all of my adding and taking away. I did make one small change by kind of taking a little tuck out of the waist on one side here. That way this piece that was originally 
cut on the straight because I took one bigger piece and then just cut it down the middle, right? That meant that all of the skirt flare was on one side. And by taking a little snip out, I can kind of realign the thing so that the skirt flare is pretty even on both sides. That's going to make it so that the final skirt is going to flow a lot more nicely. I also added a bunch of marks just in case I end up using this pattern again in the future, kind of as a note to future me. Things like there's no seam allowance on the side seams here, but there is seam allowance on the neckline and the arm side, which I guess now that I think about it, I probably could have just trimmed those off so that it was all no seam allowance, but that's okay. I marked it as clearly as I can so that hopefully future me isn't too confused. The only thing that I didn't end up marking down was how much length was needed to make it reach the floor. You'll notice here that it does not reach the floor. That way I can save a little bit on fabric or patterning paper, whatever I'm using to make my pattern, because I know that I just want to continue this same angle all the way down until I reach my desired length, whether that's floor length, a little bit longer if I'm feeling very bougie, or a bit shorter if I want something kind of more practical to walk around in. But, you know, because that length varies, I tend to not make it full length. I just end it and then I'll measure to my desired length from here. Next up is going to be taking all of these and cutting out our over garment in the wool and our interior lining layer out of the white linen. Now there is one change that I ended up deciding to make from the kind of reference picture we were using. Now for her it looks like it laces up the front clearly but then the seam just kind of disappears somewhere after the, the belly. He is kind of folded and tucked up, but we don't see a seam where I feel like we should. While I could do that and make a facing right here and have just the lacing be here and then just stop and keep all this one piece, I don't really want to do that. It's a pain in the butt. And I also feel like because all of these different skirt pieces have a very similar amount of flare, you're gonna see regular seams all around the skirt, except not the center front. Like, I think it's just gonna look a lot more balanced if I go ahead and keep that center front seam, and it's also gonna be easier to do, so. I, I have finished cutting out all of the red pieces. I was able to get most of them all cut out of one piece of fabric, but at least a few parts I did end up having to do some piecing. Like I can't tell if you can see there, but I had to stitch on like a little triangle of fabric into some parts just to help make sure that the skirt was the full size that it's supposed to be. So once I got each of those figured out, I stitched them in place, I ironed them nice and flat and beautiful so that they'd look nice. And now I get to rinse and repeat that whole thing again with the white linen. I have this really lovely, lovely thin linen that I think is going to make a nice lining. And I'm really hoping that because I have a thin linen with a thin wool that I should have hopefully not too hot of a garment to wear at the end when I you know, wear this in a few weeks. I am so glad that I made those marks to help kind of make sure that the pieces registered where they're supposed to, because without that, especially this side back and back piece are kind of tricky where they meet together at the arm side. And I'm, I'm not a professional pattern maker. I do my best and just hope it works out. But doing things like adding those alignment marks really helps make sure that the patterns fit together how they're supposed to. And then if these bits up here don't quite line up perfectly and smoothly, I can pretty safely just trim away whatever's overhanging and not stress about it too much. I didn't intend to do a lot of hand sewing on the seams here, but once I realized that this is going to be fully lined, so no matter how beautifully, perfectly I iron these seams and get them looking lovely right now, if this gets wet, it's a humid day, or I need to wash it, anything like that, these are not going to stay as beautiful and perfect as they are right now. So 
and I won't be able to access them again for ironing because it'll be completely lined. So I feel like in order to help make sure that this stays picture perfect as possible, I did go ahead and stitch a bunch of just really quick, loose kind of back stitches all along the seams here. I did a quick timer and found out that they took about 25 minutes each seam. So 25 times eight, plus all the bits that are, uh, you know, pieced. So you can see there's two seams right next to each other because this is a little pieced triangle. So ah, that's exciting. But that's all right. I did do them a lot bigger and looser than I might normally do if this was going to stay an unlined garment, like if I actually wanted to secure down the seams on the inside, because normally I wouldn't do it that way because then you end up with these really big loose stitches that might get caught on things and make a big old mess. But because it's going to be lined, all of those are going to be completely protected. So I feel like I feel like I made a good choice. With our red layer done, we could move on to the white lining. I got all of those stitched together. Every seam except for the very center front. We'll do that one later. Once I had them stitched and very nicely ironed and beautiful, I could put the two pieces together finally. I did put it kind of oddly. I did it so that the raw edges or the wrong sides were together. That way the outside that we see here is all very nicely clean finished seams. Then we could get to lining everything up bit by bit with about 10 million pins. And I then could work on the uh, shoulders and the neckline. All I did was fold the neckline in on both layers kind of like this and stitch them together. Just a really quick back stitch. I wanted something kind of loosey goosey ish. Like it looks nice, but it'll be easy to undo later if I find that I want to adjust the neckline, but I want it in place for now. Now that the neckline is done, we can go ahead and move to that center front seam, which I am going to handle a little bit differently than I've done all of the other seams so far. So our source image shows that blue outer fabric going around and over towards the lining by about an inch or so. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to take all four layers, the two outer layers, the two lining layers, and stitch them all together in one. Starting at the bottom, I'm going to use kind of a regular stitch length. And then once I'm about two feet or so from the top, I'm going to switch to a much longer stitch length. That's going to be a lot easier for me to get my seam ripper underneath whenever I take the stitching out later. But first we're going to iron this nice and super flat and then trim away the excess seam allowance from the lining that's kind of peeking out here. And then we can get it all stitched down just very loosely enough so that it's not showing through to the front very much. And that's going to get me a really super, super nice finished front seam. In case you're curious about my little blocks of wood here, these are essentially just DIY clappers, which are blocks of wood that you put on a seam, especially if you're steaming wool, because wool wants so much whenever you iron it flat to just spring right back up. If you put something on it, like a block of wood, while it's drying and cooling down, it'll stay so much more flat when you take that wood off. So I like to iron my seam, put down a bunch of my blocks of wood, and then walk away for a minute or two and do something else while I let that cool down. Now that the main body is just about to the point where I can try everything on, I do want to redirect my focus a little bit to the sleeves so that I can try that on at the same time. That's going to affect a lot of how the shoulder fits. So I want to kind of do it all in one. Now I am in kind of a silly goofy mood. So I think I would like to go ahead and draft up a new sleeve pattern. I'm going to just simply measure from sleeve length down my arm. Then I'll do the same thing for my wrist and then also for kind of elbow slash bicep. For me, they're about the same measurement, but for some folks, you, you want to go with whatever's biggest. So that'll get me my very, very basic sleeve outline shape and proportions. I also want to get the arm size and then we're going to use that to kind of double check that the top of our sleeve pattern matches that length. Here's my finished sleeve pattern in the medieval 
curvy style. That way you end up with a seam that's at the back of your arm rather than underneath your arm like a lot of modern stuff is. And that's cool because later on that means that if I decide to do buttons or lacing on the side of the arm right here, it, it's on the side of the arm where it should be instead of underneath. So that is all good to go. I did add a about half an inch or so seam allowance around the whole thing. And then whenever I cut it out, I also was a bit generous with how much extra I went beyond even the pattern here, just because I feel like it's better to have a bit too much fabric in your sleeve than figure out that you don't have enough and have to completely recut it or add a bunch of pieces in. As usual, we're going to sew the seam, we're going to iron it flat, and then I like to baste the seam allowances down, especially since they're kind of extra big. And then we are gonna put that sleeve into the arm. Now, a little trick I like to do with directional sleeves, with sleeves where there's definitely a left arm and definitely a right arm, I like to put it on and then once I figure out, oh, okay, the seam is here, so this is definitely the right arm. And I kind of like, I keep repeating the mouse, so right arm, right arm, right arm, as I then go and locate the right arm of the dress that I'm sewing it into. And I can just really, really, really make sure that I'm attaching the right piece to the right sleeve area. You know, I also like to use about a billion pins whenever I'm putting in an arm side, just because it's so tilty wavy weird like you're putting two shapes that are very strange together and it just makes life easier if you really really pin it now that our sleeves are on it is ready to try on except I do want to add some really quick just temporary lacing to the center front I'm not sure yet which style I'm going to end with this on but I want to at least temporarily be able to get it closed up as I'm getting in and out here is the first try on I feel like I've got pretty good range of motion. I do think that I could maybe let out the sleeves just a smidge more at the elbows. I did try on the sleeves before attaching them and you can kind of maybe see some of the little fuzzies here where I took it out maybe half an inch or so in this area. It could maybe do with a little bit more, but we're getting pretty good. For the body of it, I do think that maybe the front also could do with just a little bit more taken out to make it fit how I want it to fit. So yeah, I think maybe half an inch on each side, so a total of an inch. That is the beauty of the front style being like this, is that I can just unpick my really quick basting stitches and refold it back a bit more. My sleeves are a little bit long, although I haven't done any of the seam allowance up yet. So it, it actually probably isn't so bad if I put up the seam allowance. Those look pretty good. They're a nice tightness and not too baggy looking if I wanted to leave them like this. I feel like in a lot of historical portraiture and statues and things like that for this time period, you'll see that the arms are either lace up or button up so that you can get like an extremely nice fitted look without any bagginess. But I don't know, I'm kind of thinking this is an acceptable level of bagginess that I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with. The length is pretty good, although the front, I think, is just a smidge longer than I'd like it to be. I think I want to take probably almost six inches out of the front, but I think I can leave the back and let it have, like, a little bit of a train. Now that I've taken out approximately an inch or so from the middle, I think it's fitting much more how I was expecting it to fit. So that is fantastic, which means we can now move on to actually finishing that front neckline, which the original source image uses what I'm pretty sure are lacing rings. And I'm, I'm intrigued to give it a try. You know, I do have some lacing rings here. We've got some silver and gold. Uh, hers are silver looking, but I'm more of a gold girly, so I'll probably go this direction. But all of my previous attempts at doing lacing rings have been mediocre at best. So I, I'm a little hesitant to put them on, but you know what, we're gonna give it a try. It's been a few years. Maybe I will have magically figured out the technique for making it work. 
and the worst that happens is I do my lacing rings, decide I don't like it, and either remove them or just turn them into reinforced eyelets. Either way isn't the worst. So, all right, let's give it a try. A lot of times when I'm doing some sort of lacing, I'll use measuring tape to measure one inch or two centimeters or something between each one. But I think that the size of the rings themselves actually works really, really well as a spacer for this particular example. So what I've done is lined up a whole bunch of rings and then I'll remove every other one and that'll give me my ideal, very consistent spacing all the way down. It's gonna be a lot of rings to sew on, but well, we'll get there. So I know that this is a little bit unnecessary, but I was hoping that that would make it kind of clear what I'm doing. For the rest of these, I can just lay down a couple rings in a row and then take out the spacers and kind of shimmy them along. Now, what I'm gonna do once I get them all in place and ready to go is I'm gonna stitch, I think, all the way through the fabric. I, that sounds weird. It's very tempting, I think, to only stitch on the lining side, just this little flap. But if I do that, even if I really secure this back end down well, it's gonna try and kind of flip the edge up a little funny. So I think that the best way to get it really secure is to stitch through all the layers and just accept the fact that there's gonna be some visible stitching on the outside and the front here. Because it's wool and kind of slightly fuzzy, I'm hoping that'll mostly hide my stitches. But I need to accept there's going to be some visible stitches and that's okay. Alrighty, it is our moment of truth to see how well these lacing rings have worked out for me. I will say they are very, very fast to stitch on. I was done with it, you know, shortly after lunch, maybe. Not bad. I think I'm happier with my technique that I used for sewing them on compared to what I've tried in the past because the the rings, you really kind of need it to be supported all the way around the ring with stitching through the fabric. And so this time that's what I did. I think before I've only kind of done the bottom bit this time all the way around except for like one stitch <laughs> worth of missing sewing section at the very top, just enough for me to be able to get this little needle and ribbon through. That is so freaking pretty, like being able to see the zigzag like that. All right, we have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is what I was kind of fearing would happen did indeed happen. When you have lacing rings, the part that you're lacing to is at the very, very, very edge of your, your seam, so to speak, at the front here. Whereas when you do lacing holes, it's set off by about half an inch and you really have the ability as you spiral up your lacing to get some good tension on those two sides. There's lots of like tooth to grip, if that makes sense. And your lacing is able to kind of travel up and you can kind of control how much different areas are laced if you want an open laced look. Whereas for the lacing rings, it wants so desperately to be open laced. That's where it's able to get that proper zigzag of kind of tension and, and torque. Whereas when you pull it all the way closed, your ribbon, your lacing cord or string becomes just a straight line or like a barely there zigzag. And any parts of your gown that have a little bit more stress from what they're trying to hold up, uh, don't wanna stay closed. Like, because the parts that don't have as much stretch, like stress down here, you know, there's so much room that it just wants to cinch that up and like do this weird pulley uppy thing on the skirt. So it does not love the idea of being like fully, fully, fully laced closed. You can get pretty close, but the good news is this is so fricking pretty. Like it makes sense to me now a bit why this is a 1450s dress and right around that time I feel like you start seeing tons of these really wide laced dresses where you can have just tons of your your ribbon or string and you also tend to start seeing lacing rings a lot more often there both uh, on top of the gown and under and then it, it kind of keeps on a little bit into the 15th century like I can I can see now a bit of a correlation there even though this wasn't exactly what I had in mind when I started, it's so dang pretty that 
this is about to become my whole personality. I'm I'm not that mad. This is this is definitely my new favorite medieval dress. Ooh, speaking of favorites, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite sponsors, ThreadUp. They're an online way to shop for secondhand clothes, and they've added a new thing where you can share your favorites list on their website, which I have gone ahead and done and put that down in the description link for you guys to check out. I've been using ThreadUp for years and so many things have become staple favorites in my wardrobe. Like this one white shirt I got with the lace, it's like $137 originally, but I got it for $36 and it's so pretty. It has like the perfect sleeves. Oh, and there's a sweater. I love this thing so much. I got it right at the end of this past cold season and I'm so excited that it's starting to get cooler and cooler again because I look forward to wearing this every day. I really, really love this style of sweater. This one I think was estimated 95, but I got it for about 37. And I I love this style of sweater so much with the kind of embroidery weaving style. I don't knit, so I'm bad at these terms, but I keep favoriting them every time I see them just because they're so pretty. But in reality, I think I just need one. I'm good, <laughs> but my loss is your gain. I'm going to make sure that you can see my favorites list down below and shop for similar very cool sweaters. And if you use my code, then you'll get an extra 40% off your first order from ThreadUp. I put lots of things that I just love the look of, but I bet you'll find something you love too. All right, I need to finish up this dress. I did finished the sleeves already. I went ahead and hand stitched the wool side back and then I kind of whip stitched the lining to the edge so that that is all neat and tidy and lovely. And I started tacking the seam allowances down so they are good to go on the inside, but I think I still have some left on, a, on one of the sleeves here. So I need to finish out my sleeves and I need to hem this beast, which has a very, very wide hem. To very roughly start pinning in the hem, I just kind of grabbed pieces of skirt and tucked it up and pinned it. Once I had a kind of a, a really rough set of pins approximately in place, I tossed it on my mannequin to see what it looked like there. And I figured out that if I went ahead and just followed right along where the skirt touches the floor, once the seam allowance is hemmed up, that should be just about right. I did change my mind about letting it have a train in the back because the amount of dog hair it picked up in the few times I was trying it on in here. And even though this room gets vacuumed, apparently not enough. I just was imagining instead of dog hair, mud, cause this is gonna be an outside dress. Yeah, I decided it would be a lot more practical to just go ahead and hem it all to right at floor length. I'm very glad I did because I took it outside yesterday to try and get some videos and pictures. It immediately started raining, of course. And just that short time that I was outside, I've already got like a bit of a, a patina on the hem here. So I suppose I could have taken a cue from the painting and just blouse it up a couple of inches here with a belt. That way it would be off the floor by a good several inches. If I'm going to be out and about outside like all day, that is not a bad way to go. And then the very last thing I did was take in the neckline just another inch or so. Because this open style really needs tension to sit nicely and the neckline was just a bit too loose, the lacing was all there. So I took it in a little bit, just removed the lacing rings, moved it back a bit, re-sewed the lacing rings on. It, they are very fast, so it wasn't that much of a hardship. And now I feel like it lays very nicely. So with every outfit, of course, I try new things. And the big things with this one were the princess seamed style dress and the lacing rings. And so I wanted to kind of give my thinky thoughts on both of those. Turning your standard four panel medieval dress into an eight panel went surprisingly smoothly. The only thing that I didn't really take into account was that the side front piece here should have a bit more curve than I necessarily accounted for when I was cutting it. So I had to add that in, but that's why we do mock-ups. I've got to say that the skirt flare is 
so, so pretty with this style because your flare is a bit more evenly placed all around the skirt. You end up with really, really lovely folds in the way that the skirt wants to fall as opposed to your standard floor pattern where all of your fullness is coming from your hips and a little bit, you know, front and back. I do wish I had been a little bit more meticulous in how I handled the seam allowance, especially over the pieces that go over the bust, just because I feel like you get a little bit of that excess seam allowance wrinkliness that you can sometimes get with princess seam gowns when you're not very careful about how you handle it. So I love the lacing rings and how they turned out. They're so fast to do and I decided to change it to a red ribbon because I feel like that makes it look more intentional with the, the dress color. And I do wish that I had known from the get-go that I was going to be doing it this way, that they needed that tension. It needed to be kind of open laced because then I could have accounted for that in my patterning because right now, this this was all patterned with the intent of it fully closing, right? Which means that I'm not getting quite as much support as I had originally intended to get. I mean, no amount of support was going to get my apples up into my armpit the way that the paintings are. I might go back and take this whole thing in another another inch on each side to better account for the fact that it's going to be fully open laced full time, but maybe later. I knew when I was sewing the lacing rings on that they were going to be visible with the stitching from the outside. It's not as bad as I thought it could be, but it's, it's definitely not invisible. Although if you have a design where just popping some trim on there works, not a bad way to go. Now that the dress is done, I can get to work on the rest of the costume, which that'll be in a later video. As much as I love Dear Old Agnes, I think I'm going in a slightly different direction. Oh, fun, probably not a fact, is that that painting, Virgin and Child, that we've been referencing throughout this video was maybe kind of sort of possibly inspired by the French king's mistress, Agnes Sorel. There isn't actually a lot of strong evidence that I can find to make that definitively true, but it is the popular myth about that painting. Fun as her sheer veil with a pretty little crown on top look is. I think that's not quite what I'm gonna be aiming for, although it'll probably be just as sacrilegious. All right, I need to get to work on the rest of my costume. You guys need to check out my favorites list via ThreadUp in the link down below and get that 40% off your first order at ThreadUp and we'll meet back here in a month. All right, see ya.